Hi, this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast and I'm Rachel Lancaster. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now is our time. My guest today is Dawn Maria France, who is an award-winning journalist and editor-in-chief of Yorkshire Women's Life. She's a travel writer, a children's author and a broadcaster, and she is passionate about women's rights, equality and diversity. Welcome, Dawn Maria. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to have you here. I'm excited to see where this conversation is going to go to. But I'm going to start by asking you, how did you come to be the editor of a magazine called Yorkshire Women's Life? Well, I've always written, and at 16, um, I was taken on by um, two male editors who saw something in me, and they became my mentors. So at 16, I started off by writing a um, comic strip, and that was a comic strip for the Caribbean Times, a London newspaper. And from there, that editor took me under his wings And the comic strip, which was supposed to be for two weeks about the journey of a teenager living in Yorkshire, which is where I'm located, went on to run for several weeks. And then that editor made me the Northern editor. So at 16, I was the Northern editor in Yorkshire. The Yorkshire editor, who also took me under his wings, allowed me space to write for that newspaper. So at 16, I was going into the office writing copy and filing copy. So I really had two fantastic editors that lent me their expertise and helped me on my journey. And then from there, I was able to hone my skills as a journalist, go to university and get my press card, and also get experience as a journalist with several different newspapers before embarking on Yorkshire Women's Life as their editor-in-chief. It's fantastic. And it's it looks like a really interesting magazine. And obviously, you know, Yorkshire is a big part of your identity. But I think there are many bits to your identity, aren't there? Am I right? Are there, what, what other parts are there to your, your identity? I think for my identity, I'm very passionate about equality, particularly when we're looking at mental health. That's something that really, um, something that I absolutely am passionate about. I've written about mental health and I've lectured about mental health. And for me, it's about having more of a conversation about mental health, particularly with the COVID pandemic. We've seen more people who never in their life had mental health issues become mentally ill because of COVID and because of the situation of isolation, the lockdowns, etc. And in my own community, it's something that's never spoken about. And I've been determined to actually make a change. So I've written about mental health in my own community because I think we do need to have those conversations. Um, And I'd like to even write more about young men who actually find themselves in such a dark place because men are being told they're not supposed to show their emotions. And so a lot of young men end up taking their own life. It's a scandal, and I think more should be spoken about that. And recently I wrote about a mental health men's charity in Yorkshire who are doing fantastic things in bringing men together to talk about this important issue and to show that it's nothing to be ashamed of. We need to have more dialogue and we need to have those kind of conversations continually and not to pretend that mental health is an issue that you should be ashamed of. And I've written about uh, women as well with mental health because some women have said to me that when they're struggling because they want to actually be promoted, they don't tell their managers that they're struggling with mental health because they think that would be a slight against them to show that they can't cope when in fact they can cope. And so what they say is things like, oh, um, I'm having a duvet day or whatnot, just so that they can stay in bed a bit longer until it passes. 
So I've done a lot of work in the mental health space. That's something that really resonates with what I want to do and raise awareness. And so using my writing skills, I like to push those kind of stories, as well as good news stories about women. So in the magazine, I wanted to have a Yorkshire Women's Life Inspirational Businesswoman feature, because what I wanted to do was celebrate the female pipeline and just to show other women you know, that these women have got their uh, businesses under their belt, how they got to that place and do like profile interviews as well. So that's that's gone really well. And also about women feeling like women in safe spaces too and being allowed to be women and not being scared about walking late at night, which is something that I myself have felt uncomfortable about and just feeling safe to be able to do the kind of things you want to do it's not right that I have to look over my shoulder when I go out and um, feel scared constantly. And those kind of issues that resonate. And also I've written about domestic abuse as well, but I've also championed women in business. So we've covered a diverse amount of subjects in the magazine. We've talked about girls being bullied. We've talked about airbrushing images, which is something I'll never do. And when we've got models, if we have models and they've got a spot, that's kept in. But when I first started with the magazine, there was this huge push to use airbrushing. And I said I would not. I wanted to use real women, women of all colours, sizes and ages, women with glasses, women without glasses of all figures and so forth, with grey hair, without grey hair. I wanted the type of women that you see in the supermarket, on the tube, everywhere and I wanted it to be reflective of our readers and again we've covered things like um, graduates and also women in the 50s who have lost the jobs but then reinvented themselves with new jobs and new careers so it's quite a diverse magazine and I'm proud to be proud to be part of it particularly with the content that we cover. It sounds brilliant really brilliant and it's interesting what you talked about the the airbrushing because in fact as we record this um there's a campaign coming out featuring me tomorrow and they told me that they were going to touch up some of the photographs and I said don't you touch up my face (laughs) I said I want every wrinkle to be shown don't go touching my face and they said no 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 it's just the lighting they, you know, the backdrops and things to make it sure it's on brand, but they weren't going to touch anything of me. And actually, I've looked at the photos and I can see every wrinkle. So that's all exactly. right. But I thought, yeah, it's so important, isn't it? I love that. I love that um, ethos that you have. And I think it's really nice as well that this is a Yorkshire magazine. So for my overseas listeners, you probably know Yorkshire is a, is a County, isn't it? Is it a county in the north of England? Yeah, it's a Um, county. And I think it's it's really, it's a county, isn't it? It is. um, And also, when you're talking about um, mental health, and that it it saddens me that it's still such a stigma, because I actually spent time in Leeds, so I know Yorkshire, I've lived in Yorkshire, and I remember I had an episode of depression when I was at Leeds University, and I didn't want to go to the doctor because I didn't want it to be on my record then that I'd had you know an issue with mental health because at that stage it went on your medical record and it was there forever and I thought you know I'll never get a job yeah. <laughs> but isn't it and that you're talking about it now it's still still a stigma we have to get rid of that I think it is getting a lot better isn't it but uh, but it's obviously still an issue it's getting better in some respects because we've had high profile people talking about it we've had the royal family discussing it but I know that Mm. um, reading recently a lot of people have said just like yourself they didn't want it on their their record at work because they felt that it would be a slight to any kind of promotion and as I said earlier um friends that pretend that they're having a duvet morning because they cannot face getting up because that Mm. dark cloud is hanging over them and they don't want to speak to anybody about it because they think people will think I can't cope with promotion and in fact people can cope with it in in as much as Winston Churchill for example he called his depression his black dog 
but it's still one in four people that I suffer did, it? yeah from mental health and it particularly in my my community the black and brown community it's a huge problem people do not discuss it people suffer in silence there's a distrust maybe of the medical um organizations and people think well once it goes on my medical record this is following me so people do suffer in silence and I wrote an article about the fact that in the black and brown community we need to discuss it more we need to have these difficult conversations about mental health because it's something that does exist it's not going away and so I use my writing to actually push those kind of issues and to create dialogue and conversations around them. And why is it worse in your community? I have got my own ideas, but I want to hear from you. Why Why is it worse? I think it's because some of the older people in the community are religious and they don't equate mental health and religion. There's this kind of grey area. And I think if you've got mental health, then you're not a good Christian. It sounds very odd, but I've come across those kind of conversations and it's also a sign of wow. weakness. By yeah, I've come across those conversations, absolutely, with the older members of the community. And some of the young people don't feel that they'd get support because of the stereotypes of, for example, black men. Let's just have that example um, and just say that some of my black male friends who are seen in a stereotype way as being aggressive and so on, feel that if they go for any kind of advice for mental health, the stereotype will come into play. So they don't ask for help. And so they might just suffer in silence. And then there's the stereotype of the black woman as the angry black woman who then feels that if she goes for help, she's up against those stereotypes. So then will suffer in silence. So we've got a, a way to go with breaking down any kind of stereotypes so people can get the service that they actually um, deserve instead of having to fight the stereotype just to get the help that they require. And a lot of the time they've paid into the system. So it's not like they're getting the support for nothing. They've paid the taxes and they're just saying, can you please help me while I'm going through this difficult time? I did something last year, I think it was with the Voice newspaper, which was a black newspaper, um, black British newspaper. And um, I was one of their experts that they talked to me about this very issue. And the case study they had was this black woman who was struggling with postnatal depression. And when she went to a white therapist, a white therapist called her little boy a monkey He's a cheeky monkey, she oh, said. My God. But this, oh. offend, this, this offended the oh. mum of the child. And then the, the mum was explaining the racism that she experienced, but the white therapist wasn't able to help her. And she went on to say when she went to see a black therapist, the black therapist knew about the racism that she'd endured and was able to support her while she was dealing with postnatal depression. It might have been her first child. But it's things like that where there's obviously some kind of stereotype and communication breakdown where the therapist doesn't understand the person who's gone to them for help and makes it worse by coming out with these throwaway remarks because she might have inno innocently yeah. called the child a cheeky monkey, but there was the connotations, the race connotations of mm. her saying that, mm. which she didn't realise when she had the mm. black client in front of her who was wanting help with their mental health issues. I was I was thinking that there must be, when I asked you the question about why it's worse in your community, I, I was thinking it, it there must be an element of racial trauma in there as well mm. and racism as well and the historical racial trauma, I would imagine. And I was thinking as well as you were talking that, you know, it's difficult enough for people in your community but then when women get to midlife and they've got menopause as well to deal with and then that's going to have an impact on mental health we know that black women don't get the same quality of care in the health service as white women here certainly here in the UK and I know that's the case in the US as well so there's I don't know it just seems to be that there's a lot stacked against 
women especially, but women especially in, in, in your community, isn't there? There is absolutely. Um, women in my community, they suffer a lot of miscarriages. They feel like they don't get the support when they're giving birth. I actually read something that was quite alarming. It was actually last year where some new medics in the UK were saying that women of colour can withstand more pain than white women so when the women of color did... i read that i think i read that too <laughs> yeah. yeah and so when the, the women the, of there's color there's that belief isn't there it's oh god yeah oh. and this was last this i read last year and this was new people going into the nhs new doctors and nurses but we're listening to this rhetoric this nonsense about women of colour which stand in more pain and my friends have told me when they've asked for support when they're giving birth they're kind of shooed off as if to say you can stomach that pain as whereas the white friends don't get that kind of nonsense they get the support so there's a lot of inequalities in the um the health service really which is sad to see I mean I myself when I went to talk about menopausal symptoms I was kind of shooed off but because obviously my background in, in broadcasting and so forth, I was able to eventually find a woman who was a menopausal expert to help me. But not everyone's like me and not everyone will have the ability to maybe research further. And my mum and my gran and the older women in our family didn't go anywhere. You know, my mum said she felt that she was um, dismissed when she tried to reach out for help. So she just suffered in silence. And that must be millions of women of colour. And I know younger women that are going through the menopause early of colour have said that they don't trust asking for support because they themselves will be dismissed. So that's millions of women who are struggling alone and not getting the support. But sadly, I reached my menopausal age earlier than normal. Now I'm looking back at the symptoms. I didn't know at that point. And I remember um, begging for a fan from a, a, a woman manager and just the basics to support me. And I was meeting brick walls through that. So we as women need to support each other as well. And if we're in any kind of management structure, we need to realise other women are suffering and we need to give them that space to be able to manage the symptoms as well. But I found that I almost felt like I was having to plead for a for a fan just to cool me down. And I felt it makes you feel so ridiculous and it's so indignant. You know, you, your dignity is gone because you have to ask for the basics. And this is why water's dripping down your face, running down your clothes. And you're thinking, do I really have to beg for a fan when you can clearly see I'm struggling? So I think as women, we, we definitely need to support each other more. Unfortunately, I have later on met some fantastic women who have been able to support the symptoms and been able to help me through what has been sometimes a difficult journey as we come through the changes in our lives. But it's really good that you are, and I don't want to sound patronising here at all, but we need to make sure that all women are represented. And um, I, I was listening to something just this morning, I think, I think a black woman was talking about how the, there were no photographs whenever you see a photograph of a woman going through menopause it's a horrible stereotypical image of somebody very hot and fanning themselves but they're always white always mm -hmm. you know where where are the black women where are the women of color where are the you know other ethnicities um so i don't know hats off to you for you know raising your voice and and making yourself seen because it's not i know it's not easy i know it's it's mm. difficult and uh, but i think it's great you know that you you're doing that and you are yeah you're being seen and being heard it's great yeah i mean i'd love to be part of a campaign if there was a campaign to show people that you know you, you don't always have to walk around with the fan you know that you can try and manage the symptoms and get through it and as a, as a more mature woman, I feel emboldened. I'm at my most powerful in terms of my confidence compared to when I was younger. And I'm celebrating being a woman, a more mature woman. And I'm, I'm loving the journey 
And I've really found it empowering to me. It's like a cape of a superpower. And I'm I'm loving this stage yeah. of my life <laughs> compared to when I was younger. For mm. example, um, just a little story about what happened to me um, a while ago. So I went for an interview a while ago and the woman who was interviewing me was absolutely obnoxious, shouting and carrying on and being really nasty. And I got up from that process and said, this, this is not for me and walked out. Now, when I was in my 20s, I would have probably sat there and tolerated this inab- this absolutely diabolical behaviour. But as a more mature woman, I, I know my worth And I know that I don't have to put up with that kind of carry on, as well as when I look back at the relationships I was in when I was 20 and I was quiet and mousy and I put up with a lot. I know that would never happen to me because I love myself more and more confidence in my own skin. I'm not trying to be a size eight and stick thin. I'm not trying to fit into a mold. This is me and I'm happy with who I look at in the mirror and I'm comfortable that I'm a full-figured woman and I'm a confident woman I'm in a better place than I was when I was in my 20s (laughs) (laughs) I'm having a little share here yeah brilliant good for you good for you thank you fantastic fantastic good for you and I know that as you have moved into this stage of your life you've also started doing new things haven't you so you've you've started you well you've written a children's book haven't you and uh, so what what prompted you to 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 do that well I wanted to write the children's book when I was younger about 18 really but then life got in the way university career and so on and then I thought I need to do this at this moment in time. So I did a lot of research into that market, about three years worth of research, worked with countless parents, children's groups and so on. So my book is actually a response to the children, the parents and the parents organisations that I worked with for a while getting feedback. So what I wanted to write about was a strong little girl who doesn't fit a stereotype from Yorkshire, who makes mistakes like everyone else, but is able to listen and learn. Because my children's book, The Adventures of Jenny and Philip, they're picture books. And when I did research, picture books are usually the boy, then the animal, then the little girl who's always following. And it's very rare that the little girl is in the front of the story and has the main sort of, Um, storyline and I wanted to change that so now that I'm at this place in my life I felt I want to do this now because I was a a youth worker previously in a previous life and I knew that when I was looking for positive images for my children some of them were the the most deprived children in Yorkshire they were white working class and there was no real positive images for them and I was hunting high and low for stories with little girls but couldn't find it so I knew this was the right time to write about this little no-nonsense northern little girl who lives in a Yorkshire village and who was able to hold her own and it's received fantastic reports from um, America the reviews have been amazing Um, in the UK America and various countries overseas And it seems to have resonated with so many different people. And it's it's just something that I'm glad I did. But I was writing it going through a hot flush. So I had water running into my eyes (laughs) down my face while I'm trying to write this this children's book. It was the joys of being middle-aged. I just love it. But I got it done. (laughs) I was determined. So I got the book out there. And then I wrote a follow-up. The Adventures of Jenny and Philip, We All Need Friends. And that talks about a relationship between two friends and what happens when two friends get on and another friend comes into the mix and that dimension and how that pans out. But I was going to write the third book, but then we got hit with a pandemic. So the third book is yet to come and that will introduce more diversity 
the third book will have a Sikh little boy as the character and just the dimensions of Jenny and her new friend and their adventures going forward. It sounds brilliant. Sounds really good. And uh, I think I like to describe um, hot flushes as power surges. So it sounds to me like your hot flushes were definitely power surges because they powered you on to write your books. They did. I didn't let the water running down my face like um, a hot shower <laughs> deter me, and it did push me on. And I love that description. Absolutely, I do. Brilliant. That's really great. So what challenges did you face um, writing your books? Well, the challenges that I faced, which I thought was short-sighted at the time. So I went to... Um, so book agencies and um, book agents to try and get the manuscript taken on. And their attitude was, it's a fantastic story. It's well written. We like what you're doing. But because you're not on a reality program, we can't invest in you. And I thought, I don't want to go on a reality program. You know, I, I cover hard hitting news stories. So I don't want to actually <laughs> find myself in that direction. That's not what I worked for as um, an award winning journalist. So this went on for a while, me going back and forth wanting them to actually um, take the book on and getting hit with the same, yes, it's brilliant, we love it, but, um, you know, we can't really take a chance with you because you're not a reality personality. Personality and reality, I don't know. Let's just leave that one out there. So I was determined to get it done. And I realised that Lewis Carroll, when he did Alice in Wonderland, he produced his own books initially. And I thought, well, if it was good enough for him, then it's good enough for me. So I then threw my weight behind it to get it done because I wanted to leave out there a positive story of a strong little girl um, and her adventures. So I made it happen, but it wasn't easy. There was a few times when I thought, can you not see? I know you're telling me it's a good story. I know you believe in it. And why do I need to to go on such a program to then um, bring down my brand as a, as a serious journalist and then be up against the other reality people that all they do is reality? Because you can get into a cycle of you do every reality program going and then no one takes you seriously, whereas I'm in a good space because I'm able to do hard-hitting news, I'm able to do fantastic articles that get people thinking and talking and I don't want to water down who I am just to get a person to publish the book so I managed to do it myself and make it happen and the reviews have been worth it hearing about children um, reading the books and I heard that um, the book was on a middle shelf and the person said that the child kept trying to get a chair to get to the middle shelf to get my book. And I just thought, wow, I've done something here. And also people that said they've got sons loved the books as well, even though the book is about a little girl. So that was, it's mm. been quite rewarding hearing those kind of stories. And someone said that their little child loves the book to be read to them at night. Mm. And it just makes you sit mm. back and think as a writer, you couldn't want more than that really. And that you've done the right thing mm. and that what you've done as a writer has resonated with thousands of children across the globe. And that in itself is satisfactory to me. I think it's brilliant. Well done you. But it's interesting for me because I, I've read that you've also written about being childless by choice. I have. So I was interested in, in what what drew you to want your first, I'm assuming it's your first, maybe it isn't your first, but to write this book specifically for children what 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 specifically you know drew you to do that well I was a youth worker um before I became a journalist I was a youth worker in some of the poorest areas in Yorkshire and I worked with children from difficult and chaotic lives and I I spent a lot of the time trying to build the children up to show them that just because they had a bad start didn't mean that was the end of their lives um, and as I said earlier, I went looking for those kind of books for them just to let them know that, you know, they could be who they wanted to be. They could 
their childhood didn't define where they were going to go as an adult. So that's why I wanted to write the book, um, because I was a youth worker, because I care about children. I'm passionate about children feeling safe and being in an environment where they can get love and support. And because I don't have children doesn't take away the fact that I've always championed children, even as a young youth worker, and I've always put them forward. I remember there was an incident where I'd taken the children to the park and a German shepherd dog was coming towards the children. And I pushed the children behind me and I stood in the way of this dog. So even though I don't have children, I still had that protective nature of making sure the children were safe. Mm. So that's what pushed me forward to to actually being a children's author because I've always thought highly of children and young people and for them to be safe, to be respected and to be loved. And I've done a lot of work in that area and that pushed me to to write in the books. But I did write about being childless because in my community there was a lot of pressure to be a mother. Um, I would get questioned continuously by the older women in the community to why it was that I've got a career and I don't have a child. So I felt I needed to just say it's my choice and I've made the mother of all choices not to have children, but that doesn't take away my love and my care for children around the world. And I've done quite a lot of work where I've supported loads of charities that support children globally to feel safe and to achieve the best that they can do. Good for you. Good for you. Now, I know this is I'm going off on a bit of a tangent now, but I know that sometimes you get called upon to talk on quite big national issues. And I, I've seen you talking about the cost of living crisis. And as we are going into the winter and we have this cost of living crisis. We have an energy crisis. I'd love to know your thoughts. I don't know whether that's from a Yorkshire perspective, whether that's from an Afro-Caribbean perspective or whatever, whatever it might be. But can you give me some thoughts on, on where we are at the moment? We seem to be even in more of a mess than ever at the moment as of today. I think the Bank of England is stepping in and because our currency is plummeting. But mm. um, what do you reckon to all of that? I think really what needs to happen is that we need growth in the country. And I'm not a fan of the top down. I know that Liz Trust thinks that if the money's at the top, it would it will trickle down to the poorest. And I don't think that's worked. I don't know when that's ever worked, the top down. And I feel that she she's her intro has been shocking. She's become a prime minister at probably one of the worst times. And she has taken a gamble with Kwasi Kwarteng. And we did need support with the energy crisis as well. So she did need to sort out the energy crisis. But the, the amount of debt that the country is going to be in, that's children's children paying back that kind of money. It's just, it's a huge gamble. And I'm hoping to God it works because the pound has plummeted. The market has been spooked. Um, a lot of people who normally give out mortgages have withdrawn some of the mortgages packages because of the way the pound is dropping. And weirdly enough, on social media, they were asking for her to resign when she's just taken the job. But the thing, the thing that, um, that, that was actually trending, I couldn't believe it. But the thing that really alarms me the most is the pensioners don't seem to have been remembered in this budget. I know she can't do everything, but I think pensioners needed to be taken care of in terms of they're on a fixed income. Um, I didn't like the fact that in the budget, it was saying that people that are on universal credit as of next year, if they cannot prove that they've been trying to get more hours, that their um, universal credit will be cut. From my perspective, if people are already working, they're showing they've got work ethics and you trying to force them to get more hours and then penalising them if they don't get more hours, to me is quite alarming, really. I think what you should do is make sure that they're better supported and how are they going to prove it? Are they going to take in the letter that says, on this occasion, we have not got the position? How are they going to prove they've looked for more hours? 
But what I think is wrong is when Gordon Brown brought in, he brought in the working tax credit, which meant that um, employers could depress the amount of money they gave you. So they could give you a little bit of money, then you'd have to top it up. So people are in this cycle of poverty, which is quite alarming in mm. one of the fifth richest countries. I think they need to sort out a lot of issues and particularly with with um, the older people, you know, who are ill, who need support. Stop letting people sell the houses to get into accommodation to support them. Try and keep people in the homes if you can so they've got that independence. So there's a lot of things that they need to do. And the thing that annoys me as well is that the government relies heavily on charities. So I'm a carer myself. So I care for my mum. And if it wasn't for the charity who support carers, I have no idea where I and all the users that use that service would go because they've been a real sort of rock to lean on. So mm. the char either the government puts in place support so you don't have to keep relying on charities because the charities are just there to give additional support, not to give all the support, which is usually the case. But what I'm interested in is Labour. So Labour, Gordon Brown, particularly the person who brought out the working tax credits so that employers can pay you pittance and then you have to top it up. I mean, he was talking about food banks, but food banks came in under Labour. So either he needs to look into his own situation and stop trying to um, say that this is a Tory problem because this was going on under Labour as well. So maybe they need to mm. come together, all the different parties, come together using the best talent to try and get us out of this situation because it needs to be more than one I don't think they're going to do that though, are they? No, but usually <laughs> they the, the, do. <laughs> no, but in the past they've had cross-party conversations, haven't they? Mm, when they've looked mm, at the NHS, it's mm, been cross-party. This is so big; it mm, needs to be cross-party to at least try and look at some resolve, because it cannot be right that pensioners are having to pay more and they're still on a fixed income. It cannot be right that you're on universal credit mm. and you're working and you've been threatened from next mm. year that if you do not get a job that gives you more hours, it actually says in the budget that they'll look at cutting your money. So you're already on a low wage because you're having to top it up with universal mm. credit and they're looking to take it away. So does that mean that the Tory party is now turning into the nasty party? And by doing mm. that, have they not realised that they might actually lose the northern vote? Because don't forget that they've got a lot of votes from the north. So you need to actually work a fine line and not lose that northern support, which they will need if mm. they want to get into, the, into government in the next election. But I'll tell you what's mm. interesting as well, that a lot of middle class to upper middle class areas who'd never really used the CAB before are now using the CAB for um, conversations about... And that's about, Community Advice Bureau, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the Community CAB, Advice Bureau. Community Advice Bureau. Yeah, the, yeah, the CAB, yes, it is. But they said that a lot of middle to upper middle areas who'd never used their services are using their services now and that's been quite a, a sea change for the Citizens Advice Bureau. They said they've never had so many people who were uh, middle class um, using their facilities before. Mm. And a lot of food banks have now moved into those areas as well, which I've never seen mm. in my entire life. The area that I grew up with, mm. grew up in, I beg your pardon, which was largely a working class black, brown and working class white area. We were used to those mm. kind of things. You know, we were used to um, getting leaflets through the door telling you how to um, budget and so on. So we were mm. used to having that kind of support. And if we didn't need it, at least we knew where to go to get it. 
But for the middle class areas, mm. they've never had such a thing happen to them. So it must be quite a shock, really. Mm. And it's quite sad, to be honest, <laughs> because as Theresa May, Theresa May said, they are the working poor, didn't she? She called the new middle class mm. the working poor. Yeah, it's not. It's it, it's very weird, isn't it? Because, I mean, I, I'm a parent, but, you know, you always sort of think you you want to leave a better world for your children. And environmentally, I know that's not possible anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, my son has a very different perspective on his life and his future because of the environmental issues. But now we've got the immediate, you know, poverty and cost of living here in the UK. And I was going to ask you as well, because you're in the north and you're you're dealing, you know, with with business and women in the north. I'm guessing you see quite a lot of evidence of this north south divide that is often talked about. I mean, I'm very much in the south and I, I do venture north, honestly, but is do, do you see that very clearly? I would imagine probably do, don't you? I do. I tell you what's been interesting, the levelling up, which um, was a mantra that the, the Tory party kept talking about, levelling up, levelling up. Well, there was a programme recently where it showed that... It's levelling um, down, where isn't they it? Had, <laughs> yeah, they showed me that um, where <laughs> they had Tory MPs in um, in northern seats, the Tory MPs who had northern constituents were actually going forward and getting these loans and so on to help their constituents. But it showed you that where they had um, Labour MPs, they weren't getting it. So it, it was quite a mismatch of levelling up because it sounds like if you had a Labour MP, um, you weren't getting anything. But if you had a Tory MP, you were. It was just quite terrible, really. And the divisions, I mean, it breaks my heart. I, when I went to university, um, at least I was able to go to university as a working class um, woman of colour, because there used to be a grant. But now it's a loan. So you're leaving university with a loan, you're not guaranteed to get a graduate job, then you can't buy a house. Although the news on stamp duty with the mini budget was quite quite promising for first-time buyers but then we've got the pound spiraling out of control so it, it's very bleak for people leaving university now compared to how it was when me and you left you know at least we could see a future and now it just feels it just feels quite dire it's, I'm, I'm quite a positive person and I'm hoping that we, we can turn a corner at the very least I'm glad with the um, mm. with the freeze on fuel because that's that's helped in some respect. As a carer, I know that's helped in my situation with my mum. Because as a pensioner, she was getting quite concerned being on a fixed income. So mm. that's a bit of a buffer that that's helping. But does Sir Alan Sugar really need four hundred pounds if this four hundred pounds is going to everyone? I think it should have been. I know. It should have, I think they should have been smarter in where they were aiming it at. It's just, it's just and I'll, I'll tell our American listeners, Alan, Alan, yeah, Alan Sugar is like our equivalent of Donald Trump in a way, isn't he? Because he was he was the man yes. who started on the well, didn't start, but he did the Apprentice like Donald Trump did the Apprentice. So it's like giving Donald Trump £400 in, in a benefit because because yeah. everybody gets it over a certain age, yeah. Mm. Yeah, everyone gets it, There's but I think it should have been targeted. Deal with, isn't there? Yeah, I think it should have been targeted to the people who need it most, the pensioners, the people on benefit, the people who are on low wages, you know, on the national minimum wage. It should have been targeted to those people instead of doing it as a blanket and looking at the debt for the country is absolutely eye-watering. You don't know if they're going to ever get to a place of paying that debt. Oh, dear. And on that happy note, I'm going to change tag again. And I'm going to ask you, what would you most like women our age to know? I'd like them to know that... Um, it's okay to be middle aged. It's something that is our superpower. You think about all the experience that we've got 
to get us to this stage in our life. This is a celebration. This is not something to be mournful about. We don't need to fall into a stereotype. We own our own superpower. We've got that strength for monsters. And it's not as frightening as you think. It's something that we can get through. And the confidence that it gives you is just unbelievable. And you become more sassy. You become more forthright. You come into your own. You have the strength and you've got the power. And that's what I'd like them to know. It's not as scary as you think. And it is actually your superpower because you're bringing years of experience to this age and it's something to celebrate. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, follow and share it. Also, giving a five-star review really helps get the word out. You'll find the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you can get my book, Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Make the very best of your next chapter. Help me change the world, one magnificent midlife woman at a time.